of um, Tim Gafton, who's the help of Kearney Kazazian from the University of Western Ontario in, in, in Toronto, Canada. And more recently, uh, Renee Wickstrom, uh, one of the newest members of the, of the board, has initiated a Delphi survey of Norse uh, and fires experts uh, worldwide. The Institute has also been behind the uh, creation of research grants for uh, to True Nord and, and AES, and these are the recipients of those grants, and they will share their uh, research today and, and, and tomorrow uh, with us. Before I hand over the microphone to uh, Nor Wong, I would like to uh, take a few seconds to thank again the organizers, Larry, Nora, Nora and uh, Yashwan Paluru for the scientific symposium, Krista Ashbeck, um, Tanil Gafton, and Karen Kazazian for the family conference. Thanks already to uh, all the speakers for the time they are uh, devoting to us, and thank you all for uh, joining us. Nora, the mic is yours. So, thank you, Nicholas. Um, we want them to learn more about Norse. More than introducing new tools and approaches to study Norse, we want this symposium to be an opportunity to collaborate. We want you to look around this room and think whose work will make a difference in Norse research? Whom might you want to work with in the future? We want you to recommend topics and speakers we should highlight in future symposiums and Norse research bulletins. The Norse research uh, the Norse Institute is developing a five-year plan to collect clinical data and biological specimens of Norse patients to be shared with the expanding community of Norse researchers. To do that, we are developing our medical and scientific board further into specialized working groups. If you want to join us, please contact me, Larry, or Nicholas Gaspard. Finally, we want you to expand thinking and communication to include families. The doctor-family relationship built in the ICU is often stressful and unidirectional. The Norse Institute wants to change that. Just as families are dependent on doctors to treat Norse, you are dependent on families to participate in your studies, contribute biosamples, and to support your research. The seven Norse Institute grants awarded through NORD and AES so far, the Multicenter Perspective Norse Study and the Norse Family Registry have all been funded by the families and friends of Norse patients. This symposium and the family conference that follows are the ways we realize the Norse Institute's mission to build a shared community of Norse researchers, clinicians, and families. Our next speaker is La Lawrence J. Hirsch. Dr. Hirsch is Professor of Neurology, Chief of the Division of Epilepsy and EEG, Co-Director of the Yale Comprehensive Epilepsy Center, and Co-Director of the Critical Care EEG Monitoring Program. He, along with Nicholas Gaspard, is Co-Chair of the Norse Institute Medical Advisory Board and Lead Author of the published paper on the Consensus Definition of Norse and Fires. Larry? Great, thank you very much, Nicholas and Nora. Um, and my job is basically to just get this going. Uh, I do have... You heard, just heard the introduction. Um, we have really two special keynote lectures, um, which I'll introduce this the speakers as we get to them. Um, and then we're gonna have a 10 minute break around 11.20. And then we have a data blitz with four speakers uh, doing related research. And then we'll end just with some discussion. Um, so I do want people to keep in mind throughout this, uh, the basic question is over the next five, 10 years, what specimens should we be saving, storing, and doing research on? Which type of analysis should we be doing on them? And basically, where should we put our efforts and money? Um, so that's uh, 
what I want you to keep in mind while we go through this. All right, so uh, to keep on time, let's just get started. So the first of our two keynote speakers is Dr. Anna Maria Vizzani. She's the head of the Laboratory for Experimental Neurology in the Department of Neuroscience at the Mario Negri Institute in Milan, in Italy, chair of the Commission on Neurobiology of the International League Against Epilepsy. She's an associate editor for Epilepsia. Uh, she received the American Epilepsy Society's Recognition Award for Basic Science. Uh, and we were able to recruit her to be a member of the Scientific Advisory Board of the Norse Institute. And if you ever try and read about or research inflammation and seizures, inflammation status epilepticus, you will see that Dr. Vizzani has uh, been a leader and prolific in publishing in this area for a long time now. So without further ado, I will turn it over to Anna Maria. Okay, thank you very much, Larry. Thank you, Nora, and all the organizers for inviting me to contribute to this uh, scientific workshop. And I'm going to show you the preclinical and clinical data uh, that support uh, a role for neuroinflammation in the generation and recurrence of uh, uh, unremitting seizures in Norse and uh, specifically in fires. So I'm uh, talking specifically about neuroinflammation that is a brain response to the activation of innate immune mechanism. And this response has been first described in animal models of status epilepticus and of acute and chronic seizures. And subsequently, it has been validated in human epilepsy, tissue resected as surgery or at autopsy uh, from patients with drug resistant seizures. This uh, neuroinflammatory response uh, consists of the biosynthesis and release of uh, molecules with inflammatory properties uh, from uh, brain resident cells, uh, which include uh, activated microglia and astrocytes, uh, as well as uh, neuronal cells, uh, and also cell components of the blood-brain barrier, in particular endothelial cells. These uh, cells not only release inflammatory molecules, uh, in response to an epileptogenic injury or during seizures, but they also uh, upregulate the relevant receptors for these molecules uh, and the cell signaling. And there is evidence for both autocrine and paracrine effects uh, of the inflammatory mediators upon their release in the extracellular milieu. This neuroinflammatory response is associated with evidence for oxidative stress, and these two phenomena reinforce each other. Uh, very importantly, the experimental studies and pharmacological interventions done in animal models of seizures and epilepsy have clearly shown that this neuroinflammatory response is not a mere epiphenomenon of the tissue pathology, but several specific inflammatory mediators uh, importantly contribute to seizure mechanism, and therefore they play a role in the establishment of um, of a chronic seizure focus. Uh, another important aspect is several of the molecules that are induced during neuroinflammation can also be uh, monitored in the blood stream where they change by mirroring changes in the, in the brain tissue. Therefore, they may play a potential role as a biomarker of the neuroinflammatory response. Very importantly, the inflammatory molecules that are in the brain uh, may um, have uh, specific roles uh, as neuromodulators, uh, which is very important for their involvement in seizure mechanism. This means that uh, these molecules can rapidly uh, modulate uh, neuronal function by post-translational alterations uh, of both uh, voltage-gated and, uh, and receptor couple ion channels. And this uh, leads to rapid modifications in cell excitability. They can also uh, modify both glutamatergic and gabaergic neurotransmission, contributing to their imbalance. 
So these neuromodulatory properties can be mediated by um, the receptors of inflammatory molecules that are expressed in neuronal cells but can also be indirectly mediated by astrocytes. It is a very important cell population that contributes to the neuroinflammatory response and also to neuronal network dysfunctions. As I mentioned before, the, the first evidence of neuroinflammation has been uh, um, obtained uh, studying animal models of the novo status epilepticus, which can be induced uh, in rats or mice at different ages with chemoconvulsive drugs or by electrical stimulations. This status epilepticus is typically refractory to benzodiazepine and can last, um, can have a different length of time in its development depending on the model and can also induce both acute and chronic um, sequelae. The acute sequelae include mortality and neuronal cell loss in specific forebrain regions, and the long-term consequences include cognitive and behavioral alterations and the onset and progression of spontaneous seizures, therefore the onset of epilepsy. Between the status epilepticus and the long-term consequences, there is, there is a latency time that can be of variable duration depending on the models, but there are also status epilepticus models where there is a continuum between the end of status epilepticus and the beginning of spontaneous epileptic activity. So using this model, it has been uh, um, possible to establish two important points. The first point is that if we induce a neuroinflammatory response in the brain before causing status epilepticus in the animal models, for example, by injected animals either systemically or intracerebrally with inflammatory triggers, then we can decrease the threshold to status epilepticus induction and increase significantly the incidence of this phenomenon in the animals. Moreover, this progressive neuroinflammatory milieu can worsen both the acute and long-term consequences of status epilepticus. On the other hand, when status epilepticus is triggered, then it can cause per se a neurogenic inflammatory response, therefore helping to contribute to the establishment of this pathologic tissue cycle between inflammation and seizures. This is an example of the neuroinflammatory response occurring in a model of electrical status epilepticus in rats where transcriptomic analysis of inflammatory molecules and pathways was done in the hippocampus, that is one area of seizure onset in this model. So you can see how many inflammatory pathways are rapid regulated and the histological analysis of the brain tissue of prototypical inflammatory cytokines has shown that many of these uh, molecular uh, inflammatory molecules, sorry, are induced in uh, parenchymal glial cells, particularly in activated microglia and astrocytes, but also in endothelial cells of the blood-brain barrier. So a more detailed uh, time course uh, of the induction, for example, of prototypical inflammatory cytokines, uh, all of which have ectogenic properties, has uh, shown that these molecules are really rapidly induced uh, upon induction of status epilepticus, and some of them persist in the tissue for a long time. If we focus on the IL-1 beta signaling, we see that there is also induction of IL-1 receptor antagonists in the brain. This is an important anti-inflammatory molecule that uh, is uh, pivotal for controlling the activation of the IL-1 beta system. However, we see that the induction of IL-1A occurs with a delay and to a minor extent as compared to the pro-inflammatory cytokine, which denotes an inefficient resolution of the pro-inflammatory signaling, since we know that IL-1 array should be induced concomitantly with the pro-inflammatory cytokine and to a very large excess in order to be able to rapidly uh, control the IL-1 beta signaling and to keep it within the homeostatic uh, frame uh, to prevent it becomes detrimental for the tissue. So uh, from the experimental studies, we know that, uh, and as I said before, neuroinflammatory response can lower seizure threshold and promote seizure precipitation following a second hit. 
However, we also know that if the neuroinflammatory uh, process is uh, extensive and strong enough, it may also trigger seizures per se. This has been demonstrated, for example, in this nice work where lipopolysaccharide was exposed to the cortical tissue in rats. Lipopolysaccharide activates toll-like receptor 4 in microglia and induces a neuroinflammatory response. And as you can see here, it was able in these experiments to produce epileptiform activity that was completely prevented by the co-administration of IL-1 receptor antagonists, therefore demonstrating that the, the endogenous IL-1 beta was driving this epileptiform activity. So I would like now to exemplify some pharmacological interventions that can interfere with specific ictogenic inflammatory signaling, and I will focus on the IL-1 beta system. These interventions have been done in animal models at the crucial point of interventions along the IL-1 beta pathway. One point of intervention was to block the P2X7 receptors that are expressed by uh, innate immunity cells, in particular in the brain in microglia, and they are activated by the dangerous signal ATP that is released during seizures and also following epileptogenic injury. Upon the activation of P2X7 receptors, there is uh, the induction of the inflammasome that is a macromolecular complex that is pivotal for the biosynthesis and release of, of interleukin-1 beta. Another intervention can be done at the level of caspase-1 that is part of the inflammasome and has a key biosynthetic enzyme for the cleavage and the production of the mature and biologically active uh, interleukin-1 beta or one can block the IL-1 receptor type 1, that is the receptor that mediates the biological action of IL-1 beta, for example, using the uh, recombinant form of IL-1 array that is also called anakinra. So with these pharmacological interventions in animal models, it was possible to uh, drastically reduce uh, recurrent seizures, both in the acute and in the chronic setting, and also mediate this intervention, mediate anti the epileptogenic effects in animal models of acquired epilepsy. So this set of evidence uh, suggested the hypothesis that the neuroinflammatory response in the brain might be a pathogenic mechanism involved in the unremitting seizures occurring in north and fires. Indeed, a cytokine cascade was measured in patients in the CSF of patients with NORSE in support of this hypothesis. In the experimental setting, for example, we know that mild fever associated with a neuroinflammatory response can result in a long-term decrease in seizure threshold in animal models. These are two examples of the cytokine cascade that is measured, has been measured in the CSF of uh, patients with NORSE. And uh, many of these uh, uh, molecules, uh, both chemokines and cytokines, have ictogenic properties in the animal models. And the um, induction in the CSF is much more prominent than the changes occurring in the blood serum, where some of these uh, molecules do not even change. So this uh, uh, suggests that the molecules are uh, produced inside the brain. There is also histopathological evidence for the presence of a neuroinflammation in NORSE. This is a, a histological analysis of a biopsy obtained from a patient with NORSE before the surgical resection of the seizure focus. And the analysis of this tissue showed the prominent activation of astrocytes that were able to uh, produce interleukin-1 beta and activate this enzyme that is uh, the rate-limiting enzyme for the kynurenin pathways. That is a pathway involved in innate immunity activation. Eleonora Ronica also analyzed uh, brain tissue, hippocampal tissue in this case, from patients who died in status epilepticus of different etiologies. And uh, she was able to report evidence for uh, um, oxidative stress markers, as well as ictogenic uh, danger signals, such as high mobility group box one in parenchymal brain cells. And finally, this is an histopathological evaluation 
of the temporal lobe uh, from autopsy of a child who unfortunately died um, after 27 days in intensive care unit and she was diagnosed with uh, fires. And uh, what uh, Eleonora has found is that there is again activation of uh, prominent activation of astrocytes and microglial cells, evidence of extravasation of albumin in the brain parenchyma, which denotes blood brain barrier leakage. And uh, she also found uh, scars uh, and perivascular CD8 positive lymphocytes in this tissue. Uh, moreover, notably, she also detected the presence in brain parenchyma cells of both interleukin-1 vita and high mobility group box 1 that, as I mentioned before, are two powerful ictogenic uh, inflammatory molecules. So why the presence of uh, um, blood-brain barrier may be relevant for uh, um, unremitting seizures in status epilepticus, first of all, blood-brain barrier damages and the presence of parenchymal albumin extravasation is an hallmark of status epilepticus tissue in humans, as shown here uh, by the group of Eleonora Ronica. Then we know from a work done by Alon Friedman, Jan Gorter and others that if albumin extravasates into the brain parenchyma, it activates the perivascular astrocytes by inducing the TGF beta receptor signaling in these cells. And this activation is very important for inducing an inflammatory phenotype in these cells, which is associated with cell dysfunction because the astrocytes are not anymore able to reuptake extracellular glutamate, to buffer potassium and to regulate water homeostasis. And this contributes to uh, an extracellular milieu which is permissive for a neuronal network hyperexcitability phenomena that underlines seizures. Uh, notably, this evidence of blood-brain barrier have not uh, been associated in, uh, in several cases with evidence of peripheral inflammatory cells in the brain tissue. However, there are also cases in which there is evidence of pleocytosis in CSF with a prominent presence of lymphocytes. Therefore, the presence and the role of peripheral immune cells in the brain tissue in Norse uh, certainly uh, needs further investigations. So one important question is why this neuroinflammatory response persists in the tissue. And the evidence-based hypothesis is that there are inefficient endogenous mechanisms of resolution. I mentioned before that IL-1 receptor antagonist is expressed at a lower extent as compared to the pro-inflammatory counterpart. And this is not only occurring in animal models, but also in human epilepsy tissue from drug-resistant forms of epilepsy. And more recently, there is also evidence of a functional deficiency of IL-1 receptor antagonist in patients with fires. There are moreover other uh, anti-inflammatory molecules that are induced during seizures and in condition of epileptogenesis, but to a much lower extent than their um, inflammatory counterparts. And, uh, and there are also um, uh, evidence for epigenetic modification that may contribute to aberrant neuroinflammation, such as promoter hypomethylation, as shown by Eleonora Ronica in tuberosclerosis, where there was a decrease in the methylation of the IL-1 beta promoter. Another important factor to consider in NORSE uh, if is, there is a, a genetic predisposition for the induction of maladaptive uh, neurogenic inflammation. In the context of other type of seizures and epilepsy, uh, polymorphism has been described in the promoter region of uh, inflammatory genes or in genes of the human leukocyte antigen family. And more specifically, for fires, polymorphism has been reported in cytokine related gene. And these polymorphisms were linked to an increased ability to produce a IL1 beta and with a reduction in the production of IL1 receptor antagonist upon an inflammatory trigger. More recently, sequencing of the IL1 receptor antagonist gene has shown also multiple non coding polymorphism in this gene. And therefore, this set of evidence 
raise the question whether we should look more carefully into the presence of genetic predisposing factors in the genome of uh, North and Pyers patients by extending uh, the investigations also to other relevant immune pathways, including, for example, the toll-like receptors that uh, not only recognize pathogens such as viral or bacterial infections, but also, um, also um, endogenous uh, uh, molecules can activate these receptors, so-called dangerous signals in the absence of infections, uh, therefore in so-called sterile conditions. And in the last part of my talk, I would like to focus a little bit more on pharmacological interventions uh, and by focusing on uh, what I think is a nice uh, example of translational research and that involves uh, anakinra, the human recombinant form of L1 receptor antagonist. Uh, this drug has been shown to have a powerful anticonvulsive effect in animal models and the first evidence was provided by us in collaboration with Professor Tamash Partfai, where we found out that IL-1 array had a powerful anticonvulsive, anticonvulsive effects in several animal models of chemical induced seizures. And this paper was then followed up by further uh, investigation and other important papers, again reinforcing the anti-convulsive uh, effects of uh, anakinra in animal models of status epilepticus, as well as its neuroprotective properties. And this, as you uh, may know, uh, led to the clinical transition, uh, translation of this uh, preclinical data with the use of anakira in fires uh, and norse and with uh, uh, several uh, therapeutic responses uh, as nicely uh, uh, re um, sum up in this uh, recent paper about the anakira usage in uh, febrile uh, infection related epilepsy syndrome. Uh, other specific anti-inflammatory approaches involve tocilizumab, that is a monoclonal antibody against the IL-6 receptors that show the therapeutic effects in cases of uh, NORSE. And the recent paper also showing that intratical dexamethasone mediate therapeutic effect in, uh, in fires. Uh, we know that the NORSE can also arise in the context of uh, an autoimmune condition such as uh, autoimmune encephalitis. And uh, um, an important question, I think, is whether uh, the uh, cytokine and chemokine that uh, are induced uh, together with this autoimmune response could be uh, uh, responsible for the precipitation of unremitting seizures. There is indeed evidence for chemokines and cytokine cascading CSF of patients with autoimmune encephalitis, in particular with anti-NMDA antibody, and also in patients with anti-NMDA antibody, uh, anti-NMDA receptor antibody, sorry, and the uh, occurrence of NORSE. And there is also evidence for this uh, cascade of cytokine in the transition between uh, uh, viral encephalitis and autoimmunity. So since many of these cytokines and chemokines measuring CSF are ictogenic, they may lower seizure threshold and contribute with pathogenic autoantibodies or other pathogenic factors to the precipitation of seizures. Therefore, I like the need to better understand whether these molecules play a role because they may inform about specific anticytokine therapy for seizure controls in this condition, but also for improvement of cognitive deficits. And finally, uh, since uh, um, the preclinical data have been uh, instrumental for informing about the use of anakira in fires, I would like also to highlight other potentially interesting targets for controlling and remitting status epilepticus in these conditions. One target is the monoacyl glycerol lipase enzyme, that is the major enzyme in the brain for the biosynthesis of arachidonic acid. So there are small uh, molecule inhibitors of this enzyme that are brain penetrant, and uh, when they block uh, this enzyme, there is a blockade of the neuroinflammatory cascade driven by prostaglandin, and uh, notably at the same time, an accumulation of the precursor, that is 2-AG, that is an endocannabinoid, therefore providing also increase in the cannabinoid tone. 
So we use this uh, drug in a model of benzodiazepine refractory status epilepticus in mice. These are the control mice with uh, uh, spike evolving for several hours. If we treat a parallel cohort of mice one hour after the onset of status with this inhibitor, you can see that there was a rapid decrease in status epilepticus and the resolution, a very, a very fast resolution of this pathological um, phenomenon. And interestingly, if the drug, the inhibitor was given to mice that were under a ketogenic diet, then we were virtually unable to induce a status epilepticus in these animals. Another interesting target is uh, uh, the blocker of the uh, IL-8 receptors. This is an axis that is uh, very likely activated in nurses since there is evidence of increase of IL-8 in the CSF of patients. And interestingly, this is a chemokine that is sensitive to the therapeutic effect of anakira. So in uh, these are unpublished data from my lab where we use reparixin, that is a, a drug in phase two uh, clinical studies uh, for breast cancer. And, uh, and this drug is a, a specific and selective inhibitor of these receptors for IL-8. When uh, we treated the animals with the drug, there was a, a fast decline in status epilepticus that was uh, of a significantly shorter duration than the control population. The drug was also able to drastically reduce the incidence of acute symptomatic seizures that follow status epilepticus in mice and also the spontaneous, uh, the spontaneous chronic seizures that follow up the, uh, um, the induction of status epilepticus in this model. Then I would like to mention the P2X7 receptor since the blockers that still are, that, that, that are also small molecule inhibitor that cross the blood brain barrier. These blockers are able to drastically reduce the duration and the intensity of status epilepticus in animal models. And finally, the prostaglandin E2 EP2 receptor axis. There are small molecule inhibitor of this axis, that is a pro inflammatory axis, which does not contribute to status epilepticus per se. But uh, if uh, animals are injected uh, even hours after the onset of status epilepticus, uh, then the drugs are able to rescue mortality significantly, also to improve uh, uh, body weight recovery in the animals. They offer neuroprotection, significant neuroprotection in limbic areas and also rescue cognitive deficits. So I would like to conclude now. And um, I think that the evidence uh, from preclinical studies and, and clinical uh, insights that I've shown you support that the neuroinflammation of sufficient intensity and duration contributes and may even per se trigger seizures and status epilepticus. And we know that also contributes to epileptogenesis by reducing seizure threshold. Nor cell fires appear secondary to overwhelming neuroinflammation as also supported by clinical evidence. An important question that we need to address is why neuroinflammation cannot be turned off by endogenous mechanism in this clinical condition, since if we answer this question, we may highlight a novel target for uh, therapeutic intervention. And finally, I think that the most compelling evidence for a role of neuroinflammation in, uh, in these clinical conditions is the therapeutic effects of target specific anti-inflammatory treatments that target specific signaling that have ectogenic activities in the animal models. Therefore, highlighting a, a novel precision therapy for these uh, uh, devastating conditions. I will stop here by thanking you very much for your attention and I will be ready uh, to answer your questions. William S. and Lois Stiles Edgar Lee, Professor of Neurology and Professor of Immunobiology at Yale. He's Chair of the Department of Neurology. Uh, his major work is in bridging genetics, immunology and neurology. Um, he's really instrumental in showing the underlying cause of multiple sclerosis and that it actually was a, an autoimmune disorder uh, with major publications in Nature and New England Journal of Medicine. And he's one of the most cited uh, neuroscientists and neurologists ever. 
Um, he's won many awards from the AAN, the American Neurologic Association, the NIH Javits Investigator Award, and was fairly recently elected into the National Academy of Medicine. Um, so we're honored to have him join to join us. Um, despite all of that, he is most famous for being my boss. So David, thank you for agreeing to do this today, and we look forward to hearing you. Yes, Larry, thank you very much, Nora, and uh, everyone. And Anne Marie, that was just a spectacular talk. I learned a lot from that. Hopefully, we can help uh, answer some of these questions. So I'd like to present a recent paper, a uh, work from Jenna Papalotto, a very talented graduate student in my laboratory, uh, where we uh, did a non-hypothesis limited characterization of human inflammatory CNS disease using single cell RNA sequencing, and then went on to do nuke-seq uh, out of that brain. Um, and most of this was performed on, on healthy, uh, healthy individuals. So the overview of the talk over the next 20 odd minutes is that one, I'll show you that T cell traffic between blood and spinal fluid is very tightly regulated. In healthy spinal fluid, uh, surprisingly, the T cells acquire a Th1 gamma interferon signature. And this is a tremendous surprise. And again, points out the use of non-biased approaches uh, to begin to examine the interaction between the immune system and the nervous system. We'll show you that clonally expanded resident T cells in the brain express gamma interferon and the co-inhibitory receptor PD-1, which we believe may shape immune privilege in the brain. Show you that clonally related T cells in blood and spinal fluid, again, healthy individuals are functionally different, indicating that the nervous system shapes the homostatic T cell state. I think this has tremendous implications for understanding of how an inflammatory event can trigger neuronal activity. Uh, in fact, it was quite difficult to show phenotypic differences in the spinal fluid between healthy and patients with the autoimmune disease, multiple sclerosis. In fact, we only saw that in the more clonally expanded cells uh, because the uh, effect of the brain on T cells was much greater than the effect of MS. Uh, doing nuke-seq, we found that a TH1 signature is also seen in healthy brain. So let me first start with an overview of, of how we approach the problem in uh, T-cell traffic in the brain. So the, there's a very restricted immune state in the central nervous system with very tightly recruited, uh, regulated recruitment of T-cells. But known that T-cells go through the choroid plexus and endothelium uh, through these chemokine receptor pathways. And what I'll show you is that when T-cells go into the central nervous system, they acquire a certain signature associated with resident T-cells, in particular with the expression of the T-cell gamma interferon transcription factor, TBET. Um, work from the late Ben Barris showed that astrocytes in homeostatic communication lead to the survival of microglia. I'd like to suggest that astrocytes are similarly influencing the T cells in the central nervous system, leading to the particular signal we see of rest in T cells. But here's a paper, again, one of particular knowledge, Jenna Papalotto and Lee Zhang, who runs the single cell platform uh, in our department, uh, and uh, also the collaboration with, with uh, Smita Krishnawami uh, and David Van Dyke, a computational biologist, and Jack Intel. But basically what we're doing is taking spinal fluid and blood from healthy young Yale graduate students, uh, isolate PBMC, and basically we form 5 prime 10x uh, to get T cell receptor and tr transcriptomic analysis uh, of the spinal fluid. Uh, we examine six healthy donors between the age of 27 and 38, general range of uh, patients with multiple sclerosis with 29 to 39 uh, years of age. And again, I, just to say, I do not know who the healthy donors were. There's no coercion at all. Uh, the graduate students arranged this among themselves. And we really thank uh, these various graduate students and junior faculty for agreeing to participate in the study. We sequenced over 100,000 cells with over 50,000 T cell receptors. First, there's a, a global structure between blood to CSF of, of T cells. We use a technique called FATE. Uh, which is uh, short for potential of heat diffusion for affinity-based transition embedding. Basically, this is an unsupervised visual visualization method that captures the nonlinear structure using an information ge geometric distance between data points. What I mean by that is we start with the principal component analysis, and I'm sure you're all familiar with the classic Tisney plots. Trouble with the Tisney plot is where a cell, a dot is, 
uh, on the Disney plot doesn't really give you any real information, whereas the fate analysis uh, gives you information as to uh, how similar two points are uh, on, on the plot. So here's an example. He's a, he's a phenotypic continuation continuum. Blood and spinal fluid, the red is blood. The blue is spinal fluid on this fate map. And for example, if you overlay the two major populations of T cells, CD4 cells and CD8 cells, you can see the CD8 um, population and the CD4 T cell population, uh, uh, both in, uh, in, in terms of identifying what the different uh, uh, um, how they transition into the spinal fluid. So the question becomes, what's the unbiased characterization of T cells trafficking from the blood to the CSF? That is, uh, what are the markers that identify these cells in this transition? We began by using a technique called phenograph. And here's a heat map, the top 10 differentially expressed genes in each cluster. Uh, so then one can then visualize uh, by using this phenograph, different, again, healthy T cells, uh, showing the clusters of different compositions between blood and CSF. So uh, here again is the original tissue on this fate map. Here's blood, here's spinal fluid, and one can see the different clusters. So for example, here are CD, naive CD8 cells, which are very, uh, very blood-like, and you can see their transition in this population here of memory uh, effector cells in, in the blood. The cells have undergone differentiation. Similar with CD4 cells in the blood, you can see very naive T cells. Uh, uh, expressing markers such as CCR7, and then they trans transition the blood into more effector memory populations. Looking in spinal fluid, we, we see three different subpopulations, uh, CSF1 over here, and these turn out to be cells that are not tissue resident T cells, but rapidly migrate between blood and CSF. We have two different resident CD4 populations, CSF2 over here, and CSF3, which are tissue resident gametophyron uh, T cells, which are over here. And then again, similar populations of uh, CD8 cells that transition into the CSF. So we used uh, something uh, to use the global structure to come up with a way of looking at the continuum between blood and CSF, <clears throat> something called uh, a tissue score. So the tissue score is basically how blood-like or CSF-like a particular cell might be. So these cells are very blood-like with blood characteristics. These are very CSF-like, and these are cells that are in transition. We do this with a, a technique uh, where the diffusion operator is a conditional vector. So it's a probability of transitioning from one cell to another in a random walk. So it's a readout, uh, readout of cell-cell similarity. So again, the tissue square tells us what's more blood-like or CSF-like and what's in transition. So those are the basic computational tools we'll be using. And if you use it, this magic technique, and I, the, the computation biologists come up with these wonderful terms uh, such as magic fate and uh, a diffusion condensation. Uh, but here we have the tissue score. So to the left or more blood-like, to the right is more CSF-like. You can see the naive blood uh, populations, of CD4 and CD8 cells um, are very blood-like. Uh, then you have cells in transition. Uh, and then cells which are very, uh, very much CSF-like. So we did a reality check, uh, looking at a heat map of chemokine receptors with known expression patterns between blood and CSF, and they're ordered by tissue score. Glenn, very blood-like, very CSF-like. CCR7 is a marker of naive cells. You can see it's very much in the blood, whereas these other markers are more involved uh, in T-cell transition. I'll show them more specifically. So ITGA4 gene is the alpha-4 integrin required for T-cell traffic into the nervous system. It's a target of natalizumab, anti-VLA4, which is a treatment for MS. We can see it's high expression marked over here uh, in the CSF component. CXCR3 is a chemokine receptor, also important for T-cell traffic into the CSF, and you can again see its expression in the CSF component. Or again, CCR7 is expressed on the IFT cells. You can see it's expressed on the cells with a low tissue score indicative of being in the blood. So then we wanted to uh, examine all the, all the data and cluster different uh, populations 
uh, using a shape-based clustering uh, technique, which stratifies the pattern of gene expression based on the timing and magnitude of the relationship with the tissue score. So for example, these are genes. This is expression on the y-axis, tissue score, how blood or CSF-like on the on the x-axis. So these are more CSF-like. These are cells from spinal fluid. These are blood. We have genes which are upregulated during T-cell transitioning the CSF, then further increase in the CSF. And these include MAF1 and uh, PRDM1, BLIMP1. Then we have uh, genes that have this slightly upregulated during CNS transition, and then rapidly upregulated in the CSF. And these include uh, uh, TBET, um, uh, RUNG3, EOMs, all involved in gamma interferon secretion. And you have uh, genes which, uh, uh, which rapidly change in the CSF, such as interferon gamma and, and PD1. So uh, in healthy, so first I'd like to show you the healthy CSF, the T cells acquire a Th1 signature. Um, so here we have um, characterization of blood CSF continuum using a heat map. We use a technique again called MAGIC. So the gene expression was imputed with this tool called MAGIC to visualize gene expression patterns across the different tissue scores. Let me just say that um, there's just a wealth of data uh, from the single cell analysis, which will provide for ourselves and hope many other investigators years of different pathways to investigate. But I'll just concentrate on one or two of them for now. So I identified nine different clusters based on the timing and magnitude uh, of the relationship with the tissue score. And what was most intriguing to us was the TH1 cluster with, again, TBET, gamma interferon, grams on K and, on, and EOMs. Uh, in a more a, a higher tissue score in the CSF. So one can uh, one can take these different clusters and uh, identify canonical pathways. I'm not a big fan these canonical pathways. They often give sort of peculiar results. But be that as it may, we see patterns of Th1 pathway, exhaustion pathways, cholesterol biosynthesis interferon signaling, uh, beta signaling, beta the signaling pathways and such. So let's hone in on genes related to CD4 and CD8 T cell clusters in the CSF1, 2, and 3 clusters. First, we see the TH1 signature. These are the top 10 genes associated with the cluster. And again, we see um, uh, STAT4, interferon gamma, uh, CCR5, TBET, CXCR3, and the IL-12 receptor, uh, particularly on the, CF, C, the, uh, the CSF3 population. We see markers of tissue residence, including a PD-1, CXCR3, and these uh, a LAG3 co-inhibitory receptor and BLIMP1, markers of tissue resident cells. And then markers of cytotoxicity, including granzyme uh, A, B, and H, and NK cell markers. CD8, similarly, we see residence of uh, markers of tissue residence and markers of cytotoxicity. So again, the purpose of a single cell analysis is not to answer questions, but to generate hypotheses. So this led us to examine uh, gamma interferon and PD-1 expression in a normal CSF, something we perhaps would not have done. And this is flow cytometry from three, again, healthy subjects looking at uh, cells with no stimulation. And this is four hours of stimulation with PMA and ionomycin directly ex vivo out of the spinal fluid and blood. So this tells us the potential, uh, you, you can't uh, synthesize protein in that length of time. So it tells us what message is, I mean, what message is there ready to lead to protein synthesis. So with no stimulation, we see a very high expression of PD-1 in the spinal fluid. This is PD-1 versus CD-69, the mark of, of tissue residence, whereas in the blood, there are very small amounts of this. And if you look after the stimulation, the predominant, a very high population of PD-1 expression. More striking was, to me was the gamma interferon. So here's PD-1 expression again, and gamma intracytoplasmic gamma interferon. So one sees that in the peripheral blood, there's with no stimulation, there's very little, um, uh, very little uh, uh, gamma interferon, um, uh, virtually no gamma interferon 
uh, not the CSF for blood, but after four hours of PMA on the mice, and there's a very high production of gamma interferon, which is not seen in blood. And here's the results of three different uh, spinal tabs. So it says that the T cells in the spinal fluid of healthy young subjects are poised to make this highly inflammatory cytokine, a gamma interferon. And just some previous immunologic work we did related to the whole idea of immune, of the brain being an immune privilege organ. Uh, when we took uh, cells expressing the co-inhibitory receptor PD-1, your total CD4 cells, PD-1 negative, PD-1 positive, we load the T cells with a green dye called CFSC, then stimulate the cells. So you can see the dilution of the dye as cells enter in cell cycle um, with either total T cells or PD-1 negative cells, they rapidly enter in the cell cycle, but the PD-1 positive CD4 cells do not enter cell cycle with stimulation. However, they don't enter cell cycle, they make large amounts of gamma interferon, is gamma versus IL-17 over half the cells, making gamma compared to three or 4% in the other populations. This is interesting because the phenocopies copies what we see in the spinal fluid and suggests that the T cells are making gamma interferon, uh, but cannot enter cell cycle. Then we wanted to ask if the clonally related T cells in blood and CSF are functionally different indicating that the CNS may shape the homeostatic T-cell state. So we use the T-cell receptors of barcode to leverage paired tri transcript transcriptional and T-cell receptor information to understand tissue adaptation. Again, what we're hypothesizing is as the T-cells go from the blood into the central nervous system, that they're acquiring a certain signal based on, uh, based on the conditions and the meta metabolic requirements in the brain. Um, it's important, it's important to determine whether the cells that are poised to traffic into the central nervous system expressing molecules such as VLA4 and CXCR3, if these cells are different uh, in the blood or do they change as they go into the central nervous system. So we looked at the uh, different cytokines and such expressed with T cells that express identical T cell receptors between blood and CSF. But first, we uh, use uh, something called uh, um, the Euclidean distance, which is the uh, distance calculated on the first 20 principal components. So if the Euclidean distance is low, it means that the various uh, RNA expressions are similar between populations, where an increase in Euclidean distance means that there's a difference. So we look at clonal groups that are unique to blood over here. We need to CSF, the Euclidean distance is, is at 10. But if you look at the Euclidean distance in clonal groups that are different uh, between blood and CSF, we see a much greater Euclidean distance suggesting or indicating that these populations are quite distinct. And some examples of the different genes that we see in identical T cells between blood and CSF include CD69, involved in tissue resonance and activation, BLIMP1, which is a major transcription factor for activating T cells, and CD103, again, a tissue rest and gut homing receptor, all increased in CSF compared to blood among identical uh, T cells. We then used a score called uh, a clone, looked at clonally expanded T cells to see how they acquire tissue resident features. So we used an expansion score, which is the number of CSF, it's the number of cells in clonal groups. So it gives an estimation of the number of cell division that cell has undergone. So the uh, light blue are unexpanded cells and the, uh, the blue to yellow relate to more and more expansion of T cells have undergone clonal expansion. So we then use a line plot of the mean tissue score and the standard deviation for each expansion score. So in other words, here's a tissue score again, more, the, the, the more above the line is more CSF-like, below the line is more blood-like. And we looked at unexpanded, duplicated, or highly expanded cells. And one can see a highly significant increase in tissue score for the more expanded cells. Again, indicating that as inflammatory cells go into the central nervous system, they're undergoing changes which are influenced by the central nervous system. And here, if we look at the cloning span and the T cells in spinal fluid, they acquire tissue resident features. And here's one example of Granzyme A is the expansion score in the x-axis. We're here and you can see that, uh, that as the cells are more expanded, they have more Granzyme uh, expression. I know you can, you're not supposed to be able to read these are all these data, uh, of course, are in the paper, but this we believe is a wealth of information indicating 
what are the uh, cells, or what are the molecules that RNA molecules expressed in T cells as they undergo clonal expansion, again, in normal spinal fluid. We also looked at CD8 cells, which acquire tissue resident features. We here expanded CSF CD8 cells, and uh, here looking at CCL4, which recruits leukocytes into inflammatory sites. And again, as the tissue score uh, increases uh, with greater expansion in the CSF. So we then looked at phenotypic differences between healthy and MS patients and the more expanded cells. So we did a global cell composition differences between healthy and MS donors. And again, what we initially found was that uh, when we first looked, we really didn't see a difference between MS uh, and controls, and it actually took a lot of work to find a difference. And as I'll show you, it was predominantly in the clonally expanded cells because the signals were much more overwhelmed by T cells as they entered into the central nervous system. So we look at the different subpopulations of healthy blood, MS blood, healthy spinal fluid, MS spinal fluid. We do see our memory B cells in MS spinal fluid, uh, but otherwise there are really no differences in different populations. Similarly, there are no significant differences between conventional T cell types in healthy patients compared to controls in terms of different subgroups analysis that we saw uh, in terms of the different CSF populations. Then we looked at the top differentially expressed genes in T cell clusters, the log fold chain between MS and controls. And, uh, and what we found is that there are a number of different genes that some were expected, some are unexpected. They are different between MS and spinal fluid. So, for example, we found uh, MALLET1, which is involved in epigenetic modulation of gene expression and regulates cell motility. In fact, there's one previous paper showing its role in EAE, the experimental model of MS. Particularly intrigued by IL-32. Um, let me go back here. Um, IL-32, which is a pro-inflammatory pro cytokine, induces TNF-alpha and IL-6. Never really heard of IL-32 before. It's not been examined in MS, but it consistently comes up as a cytokine that's differentially expressed between patients with MS and, and healthy controls. And again, speaks for the uh, elegance of a non-hypothesis-limited approach to find pathways we might not have previously thought about. Uh, we also saw, for example, June B, which is part of the AP1 transcription factor involved in T cell activation. But again, here we have a whole slew of different of differentially expressed genes, some of which we'd never examined before, which may be of importance. And uh, here, uh, again, the list of differentially expressed genes in MS patient controls looking at clonally expanded cells. So this is a descending order of difference in log fold changes between MS versus the healthy subjects in the expanded cells compared to the total clusters on the right. And we can see the host of genes that are increased in clinically MALLET1, um, IL-32, in the CSF3 cluster, again, here differentially expressed genes, uh, and the CD8 memory cells. So again, what these data are, do is uh, suggest different modules to look at, uh, which may be of importance uh, in driving MS. And so now we're putting together flow cytometry panels to actually go from RNA expression to protein expression in CSF T cell. Finally, we want to end with looking at uh, look in healthy brain. Uh, these are uh, uh, these brains, thankfully, are not from uh, uh, healthy Yale graduate students, but from uh, either autopsy or from patients undergoing epilepsy surgery, where I'm told that the tissue was removed from where the epileptic focus was from. And one can see that you have all these things, such as excitatory neurons and GABA, or all these things that, as I mean, we don't really care about. But here we have little T cells and, um, and endothelial microglia clusters here. The same case. Uh, failed to mention it, we now have a technique running where we can uh, deplete with nuke-seq um, populations such as neurons and oligodendrocytes to really enhance the frequency of T-cells, microglia, and astrocytes in these populations uh, of, of brain tissue so we can get a high enough number of T-cells to more deeply interrogate the nature of the inflammatory response while also doing the whole population. And that technique is now up and running. We're beginning to use it for uh, starting with, with MS. 
So uh, looking uh, at, th this is uh, data provided by Jack Intel at the Montreal Neurologic, did single cell RNA sequencing from fresh brain. And here's from NukeSeq, very similar results. One can see the expression of uh, lineage markers such as CD3, again, uh, PRDN1 lag3 and MPD1, and effective functions such as gamma interferon and granzyme A. So again, we're seeing this type one interferon signature in RNA expression right out of a normal, normal parent brain. And there's a tremendous overlap between CSF T cells and brain T cells in terms of the various, various uh, RNA expressions that we saw. Finally, we used a technique called cell phone DB, also developed by SNIDA, which allowed us to look at the communication pathway between T cells and the brain parenchyma. And we had the different expression patterns. I can't see that, but I'll hone in now. So here we're looking at cytokine cell-cell interaction between T cells and glia from single, uh, single nucleus RNA sequencing. Uh, so basically we're looking at different receptor ligand interactions, again, all these data are published. But for example, if you look at T cells and excitatory neurons, we see a gamma interferon and gamma interferon receptor on neurons. Again, speaking for the data that Anne Maria just showed, that cytokines that may be secreted by immune cells will have direct effect on neuronal cells, potentially leading to seizures. We also looked at cell-cell interaction between C cells, T cells, and co-inhibitory molecules. Uh, so for example, looking at T cells and excitatory neurons, see interactions between the checkpoint inhibitor PD-1 and its ligand FAM3C and TIGIT and Nectin uh, which is uh, a particularly interesting uh, co-inhibitory receptor on T cells that we find in the central nervous system, again, suggesting involvement between T cells and neurons. And finally, we also saw uh, other interactions such as uh, excitatory neurons and T cells with CD2 and LFA3 or CD58. So we have a whole slew of different uh, ways of looking at ligand receptor pairs uh, in tissue. And again, it's all from normal brain. Just to end with um, a big effort of, of our Center for Neuroinflammation, is to develop single cell atlases of different diseases. This is work from Li Zhang, an assistant professor in the department, where she's looking, creating a single cell uh, this would be brain, not Brian, Atlas of Parkinson's disease. Uh, this work is soon to be submitted. Uh, uh, we've also done a single cell uh, brain analysis of Alzheimer's disease. Again, these data are soon to be submitted for publication. And uh, uh, other work, this is from uh, Brian Haffler doing a cross disease comparison inflammatory microglia in macular generation, Alzheimer's disease, and MS. And the Alzheimer's disease data was from the recent Nature paper from Broad Institute. The MS data was provided from David Rowich, Cambridge. And looking at these different data sets, it was found that the microglia and astrocytes in macular, early macular generation, Alzheimer's disease, and MS were virtually identical. It was the same signature was seen in the microglia among those different diseases, now validated with in situ hybridization. Um, so then the question is, is selective migration of TH1 cells are shaped in the CNS? And this relates to the glial T cell communication circuits. Again, uh, what, what uh, the late Ben Barra showed is that TGF beta and cholesterol drove astrocytes and the microglia signature. Uh, these astrocyte derived TGF beta and cholesterol are required for microglia survival. And the soluble factors produced by astrocytes, including cholesterol lipoproteins, are found within the CSF. So we asked whether we can take T cells and similarly drive gamma interferon or PD-1 expression. So here we have astrocyte condition media. You can see that this can drive some degree of gamma interferon expression, but more so cholesterol, soluble cholesterol was a major inducer gamma interferon in normal uh, CXCR3 positive T cells uh, and also induce uh, a PD-1 expression. So just uh, normal factors in brain, which involve the metabolic control and regulation of T cells can drive uh, the gamma and PD-1 expression that we see. What are some of the known functions of gamma interferon in the central nervous system? You know, gamma interferon 
can drive chemokine production, gamma interferon can have neuroprotective functions such as glutamate clearance, neuronal survival, and perhaps synaptic pruning. And interestingly, knockout of neuronal gamma interferon receptors work done by Filiano et al., um, published in Nature about five years ago, showed that mice developed uh, um, depression or signs of depression and other behavioral disorders. So to us, it was surprising, but again, fits in with what uh, Maran was discussing in terms of this profound interaction between the immune system and the nervous system here, even in normal homeostasis. So um, one question is why does, I just compelled to ask this question, um, why does this neuroinflammatory signal persist in NORS? And um, I just added this slide during the presentation. Let me just throw out some, some an idea um, with some relatively due data. Um, what we learned is that exonic mutations in immune co-inhibitory pathways, such as uh, in TIM3 in particular, uh, can lead to uh, this uh, um, a hyperinflammatory syndrome. So these are syndromes where patients appear perfectly normal, uh, they can go through life, some microbial event occurs, and then they begin to develop a hyperinflammatory type of event uh, with a paniculitis, it's inflammation of the fat tissue, 30% of the patients develop lupus. Um, and in the past few weeks, we have a program project grant with Vijay Kutru discovered TIM3, uh, looking at humans with this condition. We found that patients who are heterozygote for the mutation for TIM3 have a highly altered immune system with increased uh, T cells and increased secretion of gamma interferon, TNF, and other factors. And so this really raises the question as to whether or not um, T cells uh, that these patients have, and this was alluded to earlier, have uh, mutations uh, leading in co-inhibitory pathways leading to a hypercytokine secretion syndrome. And this, I mean, just this should not be approached by candid gene uh, type analysis. It, it, those approaches clearly don't work well. Uh, they're underpowered and and uh, and tend not uh, field of genetics not work well at all. But instead, with whole exon sequencing, um, one can potentially identify, particularly looking within families, whether there are particular pathways that are altered in these patients. And I would suggest to the group that uh, be a very important thing to be doing immediately is whole exon sequencing, looking at SNPs in uh, non-coding regions, unlikely to be powered to do it. Look at some of the papers. Um, there, there's so many pitfalls with doing that. Um, one would need thousands of patients really to, unless it was an incredibly high odds ratio. The whole exonic uh, sequencing uh, may very likely trigger uh, may, uh, these types of hypersodic kind responses. And one of the things that we're doing now at Yale is uh, this generation project. Everyone coming through the door is going to have whole exon GWA scans. And we're particularly looking for exonic mutations in patients develop a spontaneous uh, encephalitis. So in summary, uh, autoimmune, dis uh, um, let me skip that part of it, T-cell trafficking blood and CSF is tightly regulated. In healthy CSF, T-cells acquire a TH1 signature. Clone expanded resident T-cells express gamma and PD-1 shaping immune privilege. T-cells with a higher CNS tissue score are clonally expanded in the central nervous system. And clonally related T-cells in blood and spinal fluid are functionally different indicating that CNS shapes the homostatic T-cell uh, state. Uh, there are greater phenotypic differences between healthy and MS in the more expanded cells. And finally, a TH1 signature is also seen in healthy brain. To hear the individual from a laboratory in particular want to acknowledge Jenna Popolardo, who really became a computational biologist and immunology graduate student, who really developed many of the tools with, uh, with Smita and, and David Van Dyke. Uh, in order to uh, examine the functionality uh, of these uh, T cells. So I'll stop there and, and just point out that what we feel it's, it's imperative as a first step um, in any tissue, spinal fluid, such, that um, one clearly needs to define what the immunopathology looks like uh, as a baseline. But our feeling now is that one also needs to look at an unbiased way, what the transcriptomic, uh, what the, uh, the single cell RNA seek this to find the molecular pathology and what pathways do patients have the same pathway with this disease or different pathways? The question of IL 18 came up. 
What about IL-32 and these different transcriptional pathways? What are happening there? I think that's absolutely critical to examine as a first step. And then with that transcript, then with that analysis, one can then look at T cells. Um, uh, one can then generate hypotheses and animal models and humans to more specifically know what one's looking at. What's not clear to me, and I think clear to anyone, is, is this disease, um, is the, are the seizures due to an initial immunologic event, which then lead to this hyper response, or is it just uh, the normal causes of epilepsy in a dysregulated immune system, which leads to this continued uh, cytokines? And, and that's really what we don't know. And um, I think we need to start with these sort of analyses. Also, something else we began to work on, a transcriptomic analysis, uh, which again is directed by single cell analysis, where one can look at multiple different cytokines and receptor ligand interactions uh, in the central nervous system. Again, as a first step to then lead to development of animal models and hopefully to come up with new uh, unexplored uh, methods to intervene, because ultimately the only way we're going to know if a particular cytokine or pathway is important is by the clinical trial. And these single cell experiments will not answer the pathophysiology, but are designed to lead to novel clinical trials, which could then give us insight into what may eventually be going on. I just also mentioned that I think another critical part of this was work, work being done by Michael, Mike Wilson. Michael Wilson, where one is looking for infectious agents, uh, and which is the other uh, possible etiology for seizures, whether there are uh, various microbes, viruses, which go in, which are unknown yet to be discovered, which may be triggering some of these, uh, um, the, the, the NOR syndrome. So again, one wants to start with these unbiased approaches to then lead to more um, hypothesis-driven approaches. So I'll stop there and uh, happy to take questions. Great. Thank you, David. Wow, that was uh, a lot of amazing stuff and pretty fascinating information. And I'm sure the researchers here are thinking about ways they can apply this to Norse now. And thank you for adding the slides in real time there to, to start answering that. I want to just take one or two questions now and then we'll save the rest for the discussion because uh, at the end, because we're a little behind. Um, but David, I have some questions in here. Uh, one is about technical challenges for doing this in children or anyone who's acutely ill. Um, and the technical challenge of applying to monocytes and neutrophils. Well, um, do you mean from brain? Or, I mean, in, in, in terms of the difficult, in, in terms of doing, so we're talking about 10X or brain. So, um, not, not brain. Know, this is, uh, either blood or CSF? Well, they, they, we only take 10,000 cells, so you just need really ML or so blood to be able to do this. Um, one of the issues of our data raises the question, how useful is it to really look at blood um, as opposed to looking within the tissue? Um, I, I think there will be differences in blood, but I, you know, I, I think looking in central nervous system is, is much more important. Um, as you pointed out earlier, when one gets tissue, um, if if someone passes away, it's there are all the other complications of that. One's looking at sepsis and other and, and other problems. So this is not an easy question to get at. Um, the most useful thing would be uh, um, tissue that's obtained during epilepsy surgery, um, uh, which of course is often a therapeutic approach. That's where it's be most useful. And the, the nuke seek technique is performed on frozen tissue. So that, um, I think that worked fine. Of course, you're looking at everything that's there. You're looking at neutrophils, astrocytes, microglia, T cells and such. So that, that wouldn't be an issue. Yeah, I'm not sure about blood. Um, it's certainly worth doing. Um, and in terms of how do you do spinal fluid, um, we're trying to develop tools. We have a number of clinical trials we're doing in MS across different sites. And in 10X, the Lumina machines are readily available at most universities. So one could potentially get spinal fluid initiation of disease, uh, bring it to your favorite 10X 
machine, just spin it down and bring it to the individual running the 10X and they could run it. And then at that point, um, we, um, what we're doing in the MS project and making the uh, RNA libraries and sequencing to avoid batch effects in one institution. So that's something that could potentially be done among different centers. Uh, they, these, these are challenging, challenging questions. Great. Uh, let's do one last uh, comment or question. I think uh, Ingo Helbig has his hand raised. If you can unmute yourself, you can just make your comment or question and then we'll take a break. Yeah. So David, thank you for, for your presentation. I think I like the idea of conceptualizing this as potential genetic causes exacerbated by a hyper responsive or a hyperactive immune state. And maybe the comment that I wanted to make is this something that you can actually check and there's some data out there on this yet. And I think we can just, based on our fire sequencing that we did with um, 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 the French group and, and, and with the German group and the international kind of collaborators, we haven't actually found any typical causes of genetic epilepsy, at least, in our FIRES kits. Yeah, this is, of course, a limited number of patients, but it doesn't seem to look like there's a prominent um, genetic pattern in FIRES that reflects that of common epilepsy. It's just made worse by a um, modified immune response. And I was wondering, do you get any thoughts about this? Yeah, sure. It was this whole exon sequencing yeah, yeah. looking at, yeah. This is really um, our whole one of our size of roughly 50 kits, yeah, where we could say based on our diagnostic rate, we would have expected this. Yeah, I, um, again, it's, it's, uh, it, it may not be the case. And, um, it, you know, one possibility in terms of genetics, we've, because extensively we've done the genetics of MS, we've identified um, about 70% of the uh, genetic architecture of MS. So a lot of time thinking about this. Um, it's very possible that uh, the hyperimmune response, I mean, autoimmunity, um, hyperimmune response is going to be genetically determined to a large extent. There may be epigenetic modifications occurring, leading to it, but more likely it's going to be underlying germline genetic variation. If it's due to common genetic variation um, in, you know, in the various pathways, um, it's going to be problematic because the power to detect that um, you know, in MS, we've looked at 50,000 patient controls to be able to get at the, the pathways. 20, 30 patients will be impossible uh, controlling for population stratification. So if that's what it is, and uh, we won't get the answer that way, we'll just suspect that that's involved with it. If it's a exonic, again, looking at the data, of course, there are all kinds of exonic uh, mutations and um, probably the way of approaching it would be to take homonuclear cells, stimulate them, see if there's any hypercytokine secretion, then specifically look in that exonic pathway. So the, my question to you is, have you specifically looked in co-inhibitory pathways? Because everyone's a mess genetically. Everyone has mutations, deletions, inversions. I mean, amazing any of us got out of the womb when you really think about it. And um, the question, have you specifically looked at checkpoint inhibitor pathways uh, that might be involved and then go back and look at peripheral blood cells. That's my you're, question. You're muted, Ingo. Yeah, sorry, I was, I, I was um, um, I, uh, muted. So um, it depends, I mean, we did pathway analysis and we didn't actually find all this much, but I think it might be, it's probably different doing an, an unbiased pathway analysis from looking at kind of targeted pathways where you would not necessarily need to kind of correct for multiple testing and look at this. I think this is something we're looking at. I would say it's actually with, um, you're, you're right by pointing out that there's a difference between like common genetic variants and um, rare genetic variants. And I think this is our thinking right now. This is probably there may be some kind of polygenic risk that drives this in the same way as you find this with MS. And it doesn't actually take too many samples to actually find a polygenic stratification if you have a good kind of pathway to look at. So if you look at 200 individuals, you could technically find a very strong PRS if it's there. Yeah? And I think this would kind of argue towards kind of, kind of looking really at these cords that were building right now in Norse and fires and look, can we find anything if you look at them jointly with common variants and, and polygenic risk? And is this comparable with what you find in MS or in other inflammatory disorders? Yeah, I mean, it, it needs to be done. And 
Um, it's the population stratification, which is really the issue in doing the common analysis. Yeah. Uh, if you compare individuals of, you know, Asian versus Ashkenazi, the major effect you're going to find are uh, population genetics. So, uh, but we kind of know how to do population stratification now. Uh, and it all depends on the odds ratio. If the odds ratios are 1.7 to, you, you'll find it with a few hundred um, easily. Um, if the odds ratio 1.1, you can obviously need larger populations. So, but absolutely this, and this is something where the group can really working together. No one group could ever do this, where uh, collaborations, where we're having central repositories and running these are absolutely critical. But they're almost, I'd be very surprised if there was an underlying genetic component uh, to these diseases driving it. Um, so that's great if you're 200 subjects. Yeah, if it's odd ratio of 1.5, you'll be able to find it. So we haven't been that All right. Us, so. All right, great. Well, we'll have a little more time for discussion at the end. We're uh, about 15 minutes behind. So instead of a 10 minute break, let's just take a five minute break. We'll see everyone back at 11.41 just enough time to grab coffee and take a bio break. See you in five minutes. Thank you. Are you guys seeing the slide presentation correctly? Yes, perfect. Thank you. So I am going to talk a little bit about immunoprofiling.